So talk to us a little bit about the more mature stages of the feminist movement. Um, the thrill in the early part of the 70s into the mid 70s passed by the late 70s and early 80s. By the 80s. And it went on for about 15 years, I think. But Certainly then there were so many disagreements among yeah. women. It was How did you the reason handle? for the disagreements. The disagreements took pride, pride of place because the world didn't change fast enough. The thing about revolutionary periods is uh, if the world, all kinds of people are drawn together in a common cause, but it's all kinds of people, you know, it's people who put their differences aside uh, because they're enthralled to the cause, they're enthralled to the, to the thrill of the cause. Now that can only last so long um, as, you know, like the Stanton Anthony generations were remarkable that they kept it going for so many years, those of them who did. But there were thousands of people who were drawn to suffrage, to suffrage uh, the, the cause of suffrage in those years, and they fell out. You right. know, they didn't do it for 50 years. They weren't on the road for 50 years. It was, a, it was a very few who were able to do that. In our case, you said it once, you said it twice, you said it three times, and suddenly it was 10 years later, and not enough had changed, and how many times could you say the same thing? That's both the, um, the joy and the pain of a revolutionary generation. Ours was generations, we were the anarchists, we were naming it. And then things did not change fast enough. So that what happens then is the differences that have been stifled in order to serve the cause begin to surface. And suddenly after you've been at the same party and the same dinner and the same meeting with the same people, uh, 50 times over 10 years, suddenly you hear things that you didn't hear before, things you don't like, things that are, are, are not suitable to your temperament, your sensibility. Oh, I wouldn't put it that way, you say to somebody whom you never said that to 10 years earlier. You know what I mean? Although I'm thinking that there were also substantive disagreements that began to emerge. For example, well, our generation of feminists, and I actually already had a child uh, at that point, uh -huh, right. but our generation of feminists, I agree yes. with you, didn't really care about children, really, or, or didn't care to make that part of the agenda, yeah. if you like. But by the 80s, and certainly into the 90s, oh, yeah. there was a different generation yeah. of feminists, and that generation was a we-can-have-it-all generation. Yeah. a generation that was determined to have love and marriage, children and work. Yeah. And yeah, it was always like that. I mean, those were words that we spoke from the very beginning. We want it all. We don't want to be mother. We don't. I remember the first piece I wrote. I said, no man worth his salt doesn't want to be a husband and a father, but no man worth his salt would define himself that way. I said, yes, everybody should have everything. Everybody should take part in, this, in the world enterprise. Uh, all of the tasks of raising a family should be shared. And if that happens, we'll have socialism and you know, we'll have a reduction in capitalist production and we will have social justice. These were words we all spoke, not realizing what, <laughs> what those things entailed. And then and people set out to do it. You know, women set out then said, okay, I'm a wife and a mother, but I want, I want, I need, I want and need a profession aside from this identity.